Hello everybody, so today I have a few updates on a few stocks, so let me just get started. First of all, I want to talk about Robinhood. Robinhood is one of the stocks that I had started a position at a very auspicious time, I suppose, because I was buying this stock uh, right, right, right around 11 bucks, um, and it's up 140%, unfortunately. I have not been buying, unfortunately, and it's a position smaller than I wish it was in my portfolio, unfortunately. Um, but I suppose, you know, this this uh, 2.4x already on this one makes up for losses on my other stock. This is the point here is not to say I get some right and I get some wrong. I got the local wrong. I got a Pandora wrong, right? The point here is to say that what I'm seeing with Robinhood is more and more a company who is a 21st century company, who is a customer-centric company, and who may take the business away from Schwab, from Fidelity, from TD Ameritrade, from the legacy banks. I see this over and over again. I see the, the, the patterns, the UI, the, the, the putting forward of the app, the, the communication. This is something that is becoming more and more clear in my view that Robinhood is going to take over not only Gen Z, Gen Gen, younger millennials, but also older millennials and perhaps even Gen X and boomers because they are listening to their customers and they're introducing a lot of innovations that become very, very compelling. Some of them I construe at zero to one. So let me let me tell you some of the things that I'm that I'm very impressed. So of course, the UI is really the best. I mean, they, they, their UI is it looks like like a 21st century business. I have Schwab. I use a little bit of Schwab here and there. The UI, I mean, it is slow. It's slow to load. It's, it looks like it was coded in the 2000s, which it probably was. That's not the case of, of um, Robinhood. And if you looked at the presentation, uh, you could see that the, the people there present the UI of Robinhood, you can see they don't come from a financial background, the people who code at Robinhood. They come from a user experience, user design background, and they make the app a pleasure to use and a joy to use. And that's why a lot of people are switching to Robinhood. This is a form of customer centricity. Robinhood, of course, has a history of innovation. Remember, they were the ones who forced every single old trading house to move to a zero dollar trading order. It used to be $6.99, $7.99, you know, even 10 bucks at some point to place an order. So, you know, you could not have such a thing as a micro share or micro position. If you had an order, you had to make sure you bought at least a thousand dollars off the stock. They've made that entirely go away. They forced everybody to follow the zero trading fee mantra. They forced Schwab to do that, for example, and other brokers. And they have new innovations, which I think they will, quote unquote, force onto other brokers, like 24 hour trading, right? Five days a week. They mentioned they had more than 30 billion traded after hours on the Robinhood platform. And so that's how they make their money through these through these spreads, through these trade movements. They have some weekend trading too. You know, it's an aberration that the stock market is only open from 10 to 3 or 9 to 3. It should be open all the time, just like crypto market. And I think they, they, they are really following that, that mantra, that modern day mantra of, you know, you should be able to sell your stock at any time during the day, right? They have a low margin cost, the lowest in the industry. I mean, Schwab is still through the roof in their margin. They have great maintenance ratios. So if you look into that, and if you look into borrowing on margin and you actually check their maintenance ratios compared to other companies, they will they will give you, you know, sometimes for a little riskier, lower volume stock, they'll give you like a 45% maintenance ratio or 35% maintenance ratio. The Schwabs of the world still have 100% and they wait until the company is super, super, super big until they give you a lower maintenance ratio in which you can use your margin. They have a lot of securities that are not covered in other, in other uh, brokerages that are covered with, with Robinhood. And they, they have a bonus transfer, aka what I call the non-employer match or unemployed match. You don't need an employer to get that match. To me, this is a zero to one move. Not only do you get the 1% match when you transfer into a brokerage account or into 
a IRA, but you also get that match when you move from another company. So, of course, at the end of your career or midway for your career, there would be an incentive for you to switch to get that 2% bonus if you have if you have margin on a regular brokerage account, 1%. That 1%, by the way, is true for new money too. It's true for everything you transfer into Robinhood right now. And then 3%, it's for the IRA transfers, right? So it's this kind of their non-employer match. This is pretty much genius in my way. They are competing for growth. Robinhood is in the market to grow fast. And they're instead of investing in, say, advertising on television and spending a fortune acquiring a customer like legacy financial institutions do, what they do is they take that money and they give it in the form of a bonus and they make the product more compelling and people switch because the product is more compelling. For example, I'm talking about it right now, you know, not 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 any relationship with Robin Hood, but I'm, I'm, it's a very good deal. It's a very good deal, right? It's like, and I have no no incentive to do that. I don't I don't even have an affiliate link or anything. I'm just telling you, this is, in my view, no 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 business advice, financial advice, non advice whatsoever. This is a very good deal, and I've transferred quite a bit to to Robin Hood, and I'm I'm thinking I have one last account, which I may transfer because that is that is just that is just too good, and and actually. Even if you don't have margin, it may be worth it to just get $10,000 of margin before you transfer a brokerage account so that you get a 2% cap. I think a lot of people caught up on that. So this is this is really good. But they also impressed me. What, when they impressed me back in the day is where, where their XA1 credit card, by, by the way, I had predicted it right. When they acquired X1, I had said, you know, they, they could have a 3% credit card, could be a permanent credit card. Well, it turns out I was right. That's what it was, a 3% credit card. Like... You know, of course, I've used cashback credit cards pretty much as soon as I stepped foot in the U.S. This is one of the wonderful things about living in the U.S.A. is the cashback credit cards. Believe me, I talked to this about my French friend. They don't have any of that. We are so blessed living in the U.S. having those cashback credit cards. Now they have a 3% cashback across the board credit card. I had been looking for that for. 10 plus years, you have entire communities on YouTube. Look at how many millions of people follow channels like the Points Guy. You have millions of people who were looking for that card. Robin Hood gave them that card and it even sprinkled on top 5% back on travel, which is what Chase has. All of the Chase cards have been made obsolete by Robin Hood now because Chase has 5% back if you use their travel portal. And today, having a travel portal, it's not really that special anymore. But if you use the Robinhood portal, you you get five percent back on travel. And so, I mean, this is this is just just stunning. And you have a lot of companies getting developed on top of this ecosystem to pay your rent, to pay your mortgage through that through that cash back. I love this product very much, and this is my only credit card that I use now is my Robinhood credit card, and I can tell you it sleeps and bounds better than logging in to my old Citibank 2% back credit card, which is bulky, which which is, you know, five times too many clicks, one too many 2FA, sometimes two too many 2FA, and too many password changes. This is not something that a company that is customer-centric does. And Robinhood works like that. I'm very impressed by that product. They are the customer-centric player in the field. Of course, as you know, I am not a trader. But a lot of people are traders. And a lot of, uh, you know, a, lo- a lot of people like to speculate. That I, don't, I don't ignore that fact. And if you are a trader, it seems to me that their announcement from yesterday was everything traders were asking for. And you can see these are some of the reviews on, on X, on, on Reddit, etc. They read their reviews and they try to address the reviews by offering futures trading. Of course, that's that's not my style. That's not something I would ever do. I, I do I do super long term, and I often discuss about removing even one year out prediction because because my view is is very long term investing. So not interested in that whatsoever. But some people are, and some people are quite excited about that. Some people are also quite excited about about that trading platform, which is something that all of the major brokerage houses have now. They have their own, and of course, it's got the familiar user interface of Robinhood and. They also have futures on Bitcoin, which is pretty exciting in the field. A lot of people have been waiting for that. A mainstream brokerage offering that is pretty exciting. So in my view, 
This company is going the way of change, going the way of innovation, and going the way of not milking the customer today. Today, this company is in growth mode. Hence, this is how I title it, right? More growth is this video. We have more growth coming for all of these companies. They are not turning on profitability anytime soon. They're focusing back on growth. This is great because this goes in line with the fact that A, interest rates are dropping in the US, Europe just dropped 25 basis points. Today, the rates are dropping, growth is back. I'm very happy about that. Now let's talk about another company who's had some growth. And of course, I barely initiated a position and the stock has been running. I still think it's cheap at 284, by the way. Um, but you can see, I mean, this stock is likely having some correlation with the HIMSS and the LifeMD because it is a similar, it's a correlated business. It's a telehealth business. So I'm sure there's a little correlation. HIMSS is up, Talkspace is up. Um, but you can see it's now it's now 0 0.159 on my spreadsheet. It used to be a 0 0.13. So it's, it's still cheap regardless. But HIMSS has gone up quite a bit. Also, for, for HIMSS went from a 0 0.08 to almost a 0 0.1 so him has gone up quite a bit talk space i have more to say about talk space i've been noticing now uh, mental health i've been noticing um discussing it uh with with, with various people noticing um companies offering it, doing more research and reading the comment section on my video on Talkspace. Also talked about it with a Patreon a little bit. And this is this telehealth thing, I think, is 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 bigger than I think, is how I'm going to call it. It's probably much bigger than I think. It goes beyond just, you know, uh, couples counseling so that they don't go to divorce or whatever. It goes way beyond that. It's a, it's a pretty big story. It's a big story for Medicare, and Medicare, of course, is going to be coming. Uh, the, the 60 plus community is going to be eligible for for talk space and of course that's going to be important because there's a loneliness loneliness crisis in that segment of the population mental health has always been extremely big in the military and there are a lot of uh, soldiers and families in the united states you know i i, I personally um love the military i lived in a military town for like six or seven years i think um i i think this is going to be a very useful service this they, they, a lot of the military is going to need this service fails i remember there was a an organization called kill 22 or something like that talking about the suicide rate in in, in this community they really need this space and and the fact that this is offered to them for humana I think is an offer that they're going to take on. And that's a serious, serious thing. Company programs. I found out that, that a lot of company programs, act actually a lot of EAPs offer it. Somebody in the comment section, which for some reason, YouTube, for some reason, removed that comment. It, you know, YouTube removes comments randomly. I don't know why. Anyways, uh, somebody had mentioned in the comment section, I wanted to screenshot it. I could not find it anymore. He had, he had mentioned that Trader Joe's had just started offering uh, mental health in the EAP, right, um, for their employees. And so a lot of companies are going to offer this benefit, especially, I think, the more Gen Z employees you have, the more younger millennials you have, the more companies are inclined to offer this benefit. This is a big deal for Talkspace. And of course, I was researching schools, high schools and schools uh, the other day, Mental health in my area is also a big topic of discussion for these high schools. And I think a lot of schools in America are discussing mental health. And the, the, the point, the initiative that they did with New York City Teen Space offering talk space via chat, you know, like a chat box, what Baltimore high schools are doing with them, I, this is a model that I could see across major cities in America and across all high schools in America. And what if you end up with a company, um, you know, just a few years from now, who I don't know, says as, I don't know, just even 1%, just even 1% of school districts. Imagine that. Imagine how much money that would be. This company, in my view, is worth much more than $360 million in um, enterprise value. And they have a buyback going on. And they just turned on profitability. And, of course, they accept insurance. So I don't like that as much, but I understand why. You don't have a choice in that space. You know, it's only $15. And, you know, most people less pay less than $25 a session. So I find that quite interesting. 
I'm looking to add to the stock. I guess I'm going to have to pay more. I'm going to have to pay up for that one. Um, but uh, not making the mistake, I think, of staying out of that one. No financial advice, of course. Let me move on to Tesla and Enphase. My videos have received a lot of comments lately about Enphase and Tesla and whether Enphase is a good deal or not. I want to reiterate a few things. If you don't have, if you haven't watched the 26 minute video, I understand. It's, I'm sorry if it's a long one. Really quickly, what am I saying here? Yes, the Tesla new Powerwall is quite compelling. I find it compelling. I understand why people get it. It's a good product. It's got the inverter in its string inverter. I don't like that, but it has six different series strings, six different spots where you can plug in. So a lot of the drawbacks from single string inverters are being avoided by the Powerwall free. So they have a hybrid solution, which I guess is much better than just a traditional Fronius string inverter or something like that. It costs $9.3 thousand dollars. It has a 10-year warranty. That's the downside on both aspects. It's you know it's quite expensive. With an installer, you're gonna be at 15 thousand on this one with an installer, and the 10-year warranty is not that good. As a reminder, end phase. If you do the combo of end phase. So you get their 5P battery and you get their IQ8. You have a 25-year warranty on the IQ8 and a 15-year warranty on the 5P battery. In my calculation, I calculated it. The cost of the equipment is roughly the same between Enphase plus the Enphase battery, Enphase microinverters and the battery from Enphase and the Powerwall free. The cost is, is similar, but of course you get a less powerful battery you, you you get you get a you, you get um, um you know the, the, the tesla powerwall is about two times bigger a little more than two times bigger is what is what you get but again that's not fair comparison because the powerwall was just released and phase has been working on next gen micro inverters and next gen battery a next gen battery and next gen micro inverter they've been working on that for a few years now. So we, we're really comparing a next-gen product to an old product. You know, it's, it's like comparing the brand new iPhone to the iPhone from three years ago. So, so to me, I am holding on to my Enphase stock and I, I am excited. I am looking forward to seeing how good the IQ8 is going to be and how good the battery is going to be because the IQ9, sorry, or how good the IQ9, I mean, the IQ9 is purported to have gallium nitride, which is which will greatly increase the, the, the efficiency of the machine and, of course, the decrease the cost per watt AC. Don't forget too, and this is this is often overlooked and, and, and phase. And you know, I, I have I have no doubt that of course the Powerwall, if they assemble a few things in the USA, they're gonna get some of these subsidies. But and phase is is really a subsidy machine. And phase is creating a subsidy machine. They get eleven cents per watt of each micro inverter that they produce. Um, on next gen micro inverters, my estimate is this is gonna be about fifty five bucks of, of subsidy per product for a product that they sell wholesale about $120 wholesale they sell it they're gonna get in my view at least $55 of subsidy so it's gonna cover a lot of their cost of goods sold that's point number one and point number two the end phase battery the way it's set up it's 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 got iq9s in there but also get the subsidy so end phase is, is kind of a, a subsidy sucking machine in the background that they are creating and they're turning the usa as their export hub so i would not count them out and also don't forget Tesla, the new Powerwall, they say uh, designed for installers, designed with installers in mind. Well, Enphase has been designing with installers in mind since the beginning. And I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll just, uh, I just know from following this field a long time. One of the main drawbacks is the weight of these wall devices that have been, been that have to be attached to the wall. Pointing out here that the Tesla Powerwall is 287 pounds versus 146 pounds for the Enphase 5P. And the new system, from what I've been reading, is very likely to be a modular system. The Enphase 5P is much easier to install by a small team. And that's partially true because the inverter is a microinverter that you, you just plug in. You plug it in. So if in a 5P you have six microinverters for a 5P, you don't have to weigh those separately. You can just plug them in once your battery is attached to the wall. So again, the, 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 the power wall is, is a labor-intensive product to set up on a wall. And it's about 
quite a bit more labor intensive and, and phase five p as far as the weight goes and of course if you if you do this on a weekend project only once a year that's not a problem if you do it every day that becomes a problem um, and both systems of course still require you to go under the planet panel and place boxes under the panel micro inverters in one case shutoffs for Tesla. So in, in either case, you have to place a shutoff under the panel. So in either case, that labor needs to get done. And so that's not an advantage for, for, for Tesla, nor for Enphase. They both have to do it. Um, anyways, this is a race. The power wall is a nice icing on the cake on Tesla shareholders. And I'm very happy to own Tesla for that reason. But I think the power wall is more of a threat to string inverter makers than it is to micro inverters maker, which are an entirely different thing. That's what I view, and I don't invest in Tesla for uh, the power wall, even though it is a nice addition. Now, I want to talk about the latest Optimus video. I saw this this morning. It was released at 2 a.m., my time, whatever. Anyways, uh, they released this video super late, but uh, the point is... I just want to point out kind of a double standard. They've, they've shown um, new things. Of course, we saw this at the Robotaxi event at Tesla, but we had not seen this non-flat terrain. So here you can see the robot casually climbing the stairs. And of course, this video is you know, not making you know a big success on the internet, not making the rounds on the internet. It's not it's not being praised all over the internet and you know it's kind of a double standard and I, and, and you know it's 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 kind of like in 1903 everybody's you know flabbergasted amazed they can't believe we invented flight and then in 1905 everybody everybody forgets that we've invented flight and then come world war one you have a bunch of people who say well the, the airplane is just it's just just for fun it's never going to be i mean it's never going to be a real thing and people entirely dismiss the airplane for like almost 20 years I don't think I, I don't think they're gonna dismiss robots for twenty years. I think robots may be dismissed for the next few years, but then they will be praised again. Uh, I want to point out that double standard. Of course, here you have a robot casually climbing stairs in a factory with actual human in a in a real environment. And do you remember when Atlas and Boston Dynamics released their video? I guess it was a little more than a year ago now. And you know that's what Atlas was doing. It was it was just just climbing stairs. I mean, in that case, boxes and, and in a heavily controlled environment. And this got a tr got a tremendous amount of praise. And when you have the, the robot doing this autonomously, you know it gets no praise. Again, this is the double standard that Tesla has. Make no mistake. In my view, this is an outstanding revolution. A lot of people just don't pay attention to that. And and you know it will it will surprise at some point, and and people will realize, oh wow, we haven't put this into our models. Maybe we need to re-rate Tesla stock. I find this a compelling long-term investment opportunity. Personally, lastly. I want to talk about NVIDIA. And then, really, I want to talk about Lama Free rather than NVIDIA. I want to talk about open source wins. And we know that when when businesses go open source, they tend, they, they tend to win, right? That's how, that, that's how, for example, Android became so big because the, the, the stock version of, of Android is, is open source. And, you know, Samsung was able to build on Android, etc. That's how Linux was able to conquer the server market. And I think the statistics of Linux and the server market, again, Linux being an open source operating system, I think the statistics are something, are something like 95%. You have the same debate with x86 versus risk 5 in the microprocessor space and and this is an endless debate closed source versus open source but what I'll say is 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 I think Lama free meta and Nvidia for iteration, you know, kind of threw a bomb in the whole sector, if that makes some sense, by providing extremely, extremely performance, high performance models for free. And when you look at the benchmark, you can see that Lama 3, as re released by Nvidia, as modified by Nvidia, is now kind of better than a lot of chat GPTs and may even be better at some point, soon in the future, better than, than OpenAI. And so, 
of course, NVIDIA has an incentive to do that. And of course, Llama, uh, Llama 3 and Meta, they have an incentive to do that because for Meta, they came a little late in the space, but they had a lot of GPUs that they needed for their advertising business and their uh, Instagrams and stuff. And so they used that to train Llama. And then now NVIDIA is training even, even better models. And so... You know, the, the, the jury is, I mean, the, the debate is still still greatly here as to whether the future of AI is going to be open source or closed source. But I think NVIDIA has an incentive for that future to be open source, because if that future is open source, then anybody can build on it and you just sell more GPUs. You sell ever more GPUs if it's open source. If, if it's closed source, then there's an incentive to guard your models. And if people guard their models, they may not use as many GPUs to um to um, um you know get into inference and do some do some inference for 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 those, for those models beyond training right inference is going to be the bigger deal in, in in ai and and of course if many companies offer their own version of open source um, software open source ai software running on nvidia gpus on the back and nvidia wins because nvidia um, kind of sells and provides the picks and shovel for ai so in other words if ai becomes as pervasive as electricity it's the provider of electricity equipment that wins if ai uh, becomes as pervasive as just one company whole honing the marketplace because it's closed source it's only going to be big as that one company right if, if, if that makes some sense so open source is going to be bigger open source eventually wins is what you find in technology often and you know what this means for nvidia is is, is that they are likely going to sell even more gpus as llama 3 is adopted and i want to point out like in in my case i find llama 3 to be extremely compelling um it's actually the AI that I use the, the most. I, I try. I, I mean, Copilot. I don't use a single bit. Gemini. I use a little bit. OpenAI. You know, ChatGPT. I use a little more. And and Llama Free. I use the most simply because it's on my WhatsApp. And you know, it's like a top trend on WhatsApp is Llama Free. So so uh, so you know, open source. I think has has a, has a strong fighting chance. And if you look at what happened between Apple's iOS closed source versus Android open source, you can see that even though the profits flowed to um, to Apple quite a bit, the the um, the the, um, the other bigger player was, was open source. So, anyways, the only point I have here is that this is going to help them sell ever more GPUs because every company that doesn't have an in-house AI team is just going to say, let's just run the open source and and open source means the pie is going to grow much faster than if we just had closed source models. And I'll conclude with this. NVIDIA was a mistake. Selling NVIDIA for me was a mistake. I sold it. It was a mistake. Now I'm hoping uh, a lot of these open source models, a lot of these new sales of GPUs from NVIDIA are going to lead to more sales of, of liquid cooling equipment and racks and servers and blades, etc., from uh, SMCI, which I got back into SMCI. But, you know, I'm not the only one who made a major mistake selling NVIDIA. You have some of the very, very best investor in the world. Rocket Miller said selling NVIDIA was a big mistake. And then if you, if you look at uh, Masayoshi Son, right, the founder of SoftBank, they, they, they deemed it, they quoted it, it was a $150 billion mistake for them to sell their NVIDIA. A lot of people didn't see NVIDIA coming. I'm now playing AI through SMCI and my SMCI position. This news about Llama 3 Nemotron and their, their benchmarking so high in, in, in the different rankings, this news is going to lead to more and more sales of NVIDIA GPUs. I think I think hardware, I think NVIDIA is going to be a major winner. There are no financial advice, of course. So this was not investment advice, not financial advice. Thank you so much for watching. This was entertainment only. Please like, please subscribe. Follow me on X, follow me on Patreon. Thanks all for your support. Have a wonderful day.